This episode is brought to you in part by our friends at Visit Lexington NC. To learn more about Lexington, go to visitlexingtonnc.com or click the link in our show notes. Thank you for downloading, subscribing, and telling your friends about the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. This episode is sponsored in part by Blue Shark Vodka, all the taste without the bite. Blue Shark Vodka coming out of Wilmington, North Carolina. And by Spot On, tech that helps your business grow. Coming to you from the kitchen studios in downtown Raleigh. And now the cork in your wine and the bubbles in your brew. It's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss, and we are coming to you from the Depot District of Lexington, North Carolina, and we are at the center of the community, the Goose and the Monkey Brew House. And to tell us all about it and how it came together is Ashley and Brent Moore. Hey, thank you. (laughs) Hello, thank you for being on our show. Thank you for bringing us into the space. As uh, we were see- saying, you know, when you go to Le- Lexington, you think about barbecue. It's kind of like the first thing that comes up. But a close second, especially in North Carolina, it's beer and a brewery. You guys are the first ones to do it here in this spot. I have to know, before knowing all the, the story that leads up to you, uh, with kind of the, there's a fire that's involved, uh, there's an expansion, there's, there's a lot of moving parts, and it's a beautiful space. But more importantly, why did you decide that you wanted to be brewers and bring breweries to Lexington. Brent and I wanted to have a business together. We worked together um, our, all of our married life uh, in a family business. Uh, we were masonry contracting, uh, masonry contracting business and we just thought what can we do that we could do together and that would be fun and that we could pass on to our kids and what could we do? And we talked about some different things, and I said, well, what do we enjoy doing? What do we like to do? What do we like to do? It was that basic. And we said, well, we like to drink beer. <laughs> yeah, did <laughs> you just look down at your hand, and you saw a pint in there? And like, yeah. Oh, right. Right. This, this is, is it. Yeah. <laughs> we're sitting on the front porch drinking beer. Yeah. yeah. Like, what we like so, to do well, here. this is what we like to do. So we said, well, I mean, we don't have anything like that here in Lexington. Yeah. And, you know, we go to a lot of breweries. And so we go to Charlotte, and we go to Winston, and we go to Greensboro, Salisbury. And if we're doing that, we know our friends are doing that. And so... So it got us talking about, very, like, we went to Foothills one night, and we were like, we could, we could do this. We, you know, we could get tanks in and find brewers, and we're like, that would keep people in Lexington, that would keep tax dollars at home. Mm-hmm. And so we just... We drove around Lexington, I don't know, for weeks. weeks, and you know, Lexington's not that big. We grew up here, we knew the area, but we we're like, where is this place? Where, where are we gonna do this? And and you said, I said, I'm never going to the depot. <laughs> that's, that's years out. I'm not going down to the depot. There's no way. It's, it's because it was, it was a mess. It was just. Yeah. I mean, Bull City had just came in. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we remember growing up driving through here, forklifts running around, furniture moving. You know, it was, we just remember it's heyday and then it was a ghost town. You know, I mean, it was not a good area. Yeah, but, to color uh, it for yeah. everybody, the the furniture in- industry was thriving here for a long time. Right, Lexington Home Brands, Lexington Furniture. Yeah. Was here for 100 plus years. Right. And then, and then once they moved out, this place was this, basically a yeah. ghost town and abandoned for a long right. time. For, they moved out 2002, I believe it was, and then... City bought it in 2007, and talk about foresight! I cannot believe that the city bought the whole area for this time. Right, and that was so long ago. Right, and um, Wayne Alley, who was still on the city council, I mean, he was one of the ones that had the vision for this, and he did not get to come in before COVID, so we were only open a few days. But he recently came in and he called me and he was like, "You guys nailed it." He was like, "That's exactly what." I wanted, you know, was to see these, you know, the buildings come back to life. And he said, I'm, I, you know, I was just 
fortunate enough to be able to see that and to see what y'all put into to play. And he was like, I love it. And I'm, that's exactly what we wanted. So, that, you know. Yeah. Did that he was, take a step back, though, when, when he's like, this place is beautiful. Uh, what you going to call it? And then he called it Goose and the Monkey. Did he say, wait, what? Because <laughs> Who's I'm, Goose and who's the monkey? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have to ask, where does this name come from? This is not your traditional uh, brewery name. Exactly. Yeah. We wanted it to be something that was fun. We don't want to take ourselves seriously ever. And I was just, uh, it just came to me because my cousin and I growing up, when we were little, we would ride the school bus together and we would meet together at my grandmother's house because our family was in masonry. So everybody was working and they would take us girls over there to catch the school bus. And we would play games and stand out in the cold and sing songs, and one of the songs that we sang was 369, the goose drank wine, the monkey chewed tobacco on the streetcar line. It's called the clapping so, song. Yeah, it's the called the clapping song. song. And so we just, it just always stuck with me that Robin, it just seems give us silly a, a and fun. Of this. You know this song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do know that song. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just, I just thought it was funny, and they, you know. I see the acronym for your sure, the G, or the GMBH. And I just like through like dyslexia or whatever, I think of it and I just keep thinking G flat minor. It looks like a chord. Like, <laughs> it does. Music. I've never thought about that. I always think of it that way. Every time I see it, I'm like, what is that? Is that like a music reference? And I'm like, oh no, that's the Goose of the Monkey Brew House. Yeah, right. right. That's cool. So, okay. You two didn't, other than just consuming beer, more you were doing masonry, you were, you were working. And through the love of it, you just said, well, yeah, we can find people that know how to do it. Right. And we can go through there. I think the first time that we were connected to you, it was through a uh, previous guest of the show out there in Ashboro, uh, the folks from Four Saints. Yeah. And they said, you know what's going on out there? You need to talk to them. Right. So how, it, was there a little connection there? Or what is the connection well, between Four Saints and y'all? So that was, so when we said, I said I wasn't coming to the depot, that's, it kind of happened at the same time. We went and talked with um, Tammy Abster at the city yeah. about what was available. And then at the same time, we joined the um, Tribe Brewers Alliance. And that's where we got hooked up with um, Joel from Four Saints and Jamie. At I mean, Fiddles. everybody. Yeah, like all the big players that, to us, were big players. You know, like we watched what Joel had done and Andrew had done at uh, Four Saints in Ashburn and how they revitalized that area, what uh, Jamie had done at um, Foothills on 4th Street and brought that. So, yep. you know, all this was kind of happening. We were like, we're getting schooled without having to go to school because these yeah. guys have pretty much taken us under their wing and, like, you know, any question we had, anything answer. we had, they were an open book. You know, it wasn't like they were just not telling us stuff. They were helping us out, you know, with, on the equipment, like just giving us ideas and suggestions on what to do. And so, I mean, it was really when we look back at it, kind of mind blowing to us because we they didn't know us from Adam. You know, like yeah. it was just they were like, "Come on, come with us." and they said the whole the whole process. They would come down here and look, and uh, when they were in town and check it out. So it was, uh, I mean, that was a huge blessing for us. So it's a, then we got with the city, went and talked to them. They were like, "This building, John Clowney with Bull City Cider Works, met us down here." And he was like, "Yeah, y'all, I need to go look at that building." And so the first time we walked in, it was dark, wet, bugs, nasty. <laughs> A little scary. The steps were caving in. You couldn't step <laughs> yeah. on anything. Yeah. Um, However. But the bones were good. The bones were we knew good. Yeah. And, that, and we knew that. We knew Mason. And we were like, looked at We were like, this we is were a, like, oh, yeah. We this is this great. Yeah, you were around brick. You felt like you were at home. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I were like, this is it. I want to set the scene for people because as is, is an audio medium, people can't see this. And you walk up in this depot district and this beautiful building. You got uh, floor to ceiling windows and the really cool garage door that's all glass uh red brick all, everywhere on the outside and it's visually pretty awesome yeah, here like it looks if, if you're in uh, durham like the golden belt campus maybe mm -hmm. like big brick buildings large format building it's kind of like that industrial right but but hip industrial but like cool yeah. yeah with huge garage doors and open framing you can see all your air ducts and everything but then like here, we're, and we'll get into this in a little moment, but we're in like a smaller room inside of the whole space just for uh, 
so we can do a podcast. But inside here, I'm looking at a massive drum roaster, coffee roaster, and that's a whole other thing that we can get into at some point. But it's a complex space. You have food trucks. Right now, we're watching. Uh, you get a you got a big event apparently happening out here later on, and there are video games and pinball machines and all this being installed for this event. It it just sounds fun. Like you, you guys are bringing a lot of color, a lot of life to the community, and and all the while some delicious beer. By the way, they can't go unnoticed. You brought us a little beer right here. What am I drinking? Drinking the Wandering Pig. Sorry. Wandering Pig. One Wandering Pig. Wandering, wandering Pig. pig. Am I drinking the same? You're drinking the yeah. same. It's Actually, drinking the Lexington Light Lager, the L Cube. The water and pig so, is a uh, hazy IPA. Yes, it's, this is delicious. Yeah, it's delicious. Okay, what? Uh, how long did it take for you to quit your day jobs? COVID. <laughs> okay, so up until COVID, you yeah. were still working in masonry. Yes. Okay. So we were doing masonry full time, and then doing you know working with the build out uh, down here through that. So, and it was in. End of April of 2020, that we decided we were going to do this full time to make it just to make it go because it was a uncharted territory for everybody. Yeah, and so for your story, and this is let's get into it because you guys had Max mentioned a lot of hurdles to jump over, more than hurdles. It was like tall buildings to jump over that just kept getting put in your path. So you started that, that fateful night when you were sitting on the porch and having drinks and said, let's, let's get, let's do a brewery was what? That was 2016. That was 2016. Yeah. And so, uh, fast forward, got, uh, talking with the city. That's when we, we signed the lease on this building in February of 2017 and started knocking out windows, um, so that we could have some light downstairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then started planning with architects, engineers, and that pretty much took up the year of uh, 2017. And then we're getting ready. Our plan was to start in January of 2018. And we got a phone call from uh, one of my buddies, Tyler, and said, you might want to go down to the depot. It's on fire. And this was December 16th, 17th, 19th, 19th. Um, I can't believe I even forget the date, but um, of 2017, we came down here and the it whole was, town was on fire. It was crazy. Wow. Um, Do we know what, what caused the fire? This episode is sponsored in part by Blue Shark Vodka. All the taste without the bite. Blue Shark Vodka, coming out of Wilmington, North Carolina. That uh, Blue Shark Vodka, we're proud to have them as our new title sponsor, and they're made with non-GMO, heirloom variety, North Carolina sweet corn, distilled four times into perfection. They do triple filtration, which makes the vodka extremely smooth, clean finish, and it makes that alcohol bite nearly vanish. Yep, they're Blue Shark Vodka, the shark that doesn't bite. Check out Blue Shark Vodka at blueSharkVodka.com. We talk to all types of entrepreneurs, restaurateurs on this podcast, and some of them are making innovative new tacos or salsas, and they're perfecting the classic brisket, but they are all working to turn that love of food into a business, and that's often the bigger challenge. Our newest sponsor is here to help. Spot On works with popular local restaurants like the Ruddy Duck Tavern and the Village Market in Eastern North Carolina, getting them set up with new technology they need to stay competitive in this industry. It's the kind of tech that the chain down the street is already using, but made specifically for you, such as a cloud-based point of sale system that not only takes orders and payments, but also ties in online ordering to takeout and delivery. Then it breaks down all the data so you can tweak your menu or set your staff schedule. From fine dining to food trucks, Spot On's integrated restaurant management system can help make running a restaurant less stressful and more successful. And you can get this end-to-end solution built specifically for your needs by a real person, Tanya Maniwo. She's a local Spot On account executive, and she'll be your partner the whole step of the way. Give her a call, 858-213-7820. That's Tanya M at spoton.com. And Joe Van Gogh Coffee, serving the community from seed to cup, taking particular care at every step to honor the bean. 
This is Joe Van Gogh's Organic Mexican Grappos Reserve, which is really delicious. The Grappos Co-op was created in 2007 and made a tremendous impact uh, for the small traditional farmers by creating avenues and resources to get their harvest not only in the market, but certified, which allowed them to be competitive in the marketplace, in international marketplaces. And it has gone from the initial producers of 90 to well over 2,700 members. What we're going to drink here it has flavor notes of graham cracker, apricot, and tamarind, which sounds so awesome. Kind of high altitude coffee coming in at around 1,600 to 1,800 feet uh, above sea level. The varieties, cultivars, are bourbon, tipica, and maracea. This is luxurious living. So go to jovangocoffee.com. Check out their locations. They have them in Hillsboro, Durham, Raleigh, in the neighboring areas as well. You can find out more information about them at jovango.com. Do we know what, what caused the fire? But that's, that's the more. question. Still up for discussion. Or who that's the fire. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, is that the, because it was an old furniture buildings, there's a lot of flammable m- right. material. But but in in and that chaos and horrific times, there's pretty cool things about what the fire chief did for your building and and those doors that you have out. Yeah. So, so we uh, there was a building that at the time was connected to our building. There was two two openings. Um, that led to that building and so that night the fire chief you know he was like is there anything blocking these openings I said no you can you know it's accessible you can get in there and he's aware of the fire doors so it was the mayor the city manager assistant city manager Ashley and I we were all you know huddled around iPhones like trying to look at where these openings were at meanwhile and the fires are raging the fire and they're trying raging, to put it out yeah. and they're trying to get out there's fire trucks stuff of water on our building there's fire trucks across the railroad tracks from us, stuff in water back this way. I mean, it was there was fire trucks out on the full city end of our building. I mean, they were just, they were everywhere. They were trying, trying to do everything they could to save to this save area down here. This end of Bull City end, our end of the block. So he came in. There was two fire doors that were left that had not been damaged by the fire, and he got them shut that night. And so we talked about, hey, that would be kind of cool if we could. Get those doors out before demolition occurs and use them in our build out yeah and so but hold on okay. because you you put those fires there and they did the, the fire doors they did, there they did their job they, did they, their job. they, they right. stopped the fire they, and protected your building they saved our building and him the fire chief at the time uh chief harley and another fireman they came in and, and did that i mean you know i think that's pretty heroic and pretty crazy because there was nothing in this building i mean it this building could have went away. Right. Like we didn't have anything in here, um, but they did that. And at that night, we didn't know. We left here at 11, 45, 12 o'clock. The wind had changed directions. Everybody at that time was focusing on this building. And we just finally were like, we've got to go. We've been out here for hours. Um, let's just go. And so actually, and I left. Got the next morning. It was raining, which it hadn't rained in forever. I was never <laughs> like... Forget when I came down Fifth Avenue, which comes leads into our building, couldn't get in. Went down Sixth Avenue by Bull City, turned in. Transfer trucks are in the way. Pulled around the corner and I saw the building. I was like, "You got to be kidding!" Like I was not expecting to see it. And then when I walked around and saw where they stopped the fire, I was totally shocked and amazed because it was right there at us. We'll and get some pictures so those that are following along can look on our Instagram feed with this episode when it comes out, but you have some photos on the wall to kind of commemorate these things. This fire was massive. Yes. It was a blaze. It looks like, I mean, the, the fire looks like it's up there 50 feet high, I mean, in these shots. it's This was no small, small it was place fire. at all. It burned, I don't even remember how many the square footage, but it was several hundred thousand square feet it took out in one, one night very quickly. Yeah, uh, this is nuts. It was 25, 30 fire departments from all neighboring cities were here. I mean, it was, it was insane. So, thankfully, they saved the building, and and then what happens next? You guys are like, well, we get to work on, on getting this started. We hurry I mean, up and wait. Yeah. Then you need to get like repermitted and all well, these things, or it like, took a year. Oh, to clean out all the to clean out everything. Yeah, yeah make sure and the so building was sound still. Yeah. During that year. 
We continued to go to the Triad Brewers Alliance meetings. Okay. And we continued to learn as much as we possibly could yeah. about beer and about what we wanted it to be like. I mean, it was really a huge blessing because it gave us time to plan out things that we didn't necessarily understand or know mm -hmm. how to do. Yeah. Make connections, make friends. Well, and at that time, we couldn't force anything because we were at the city's mercy to get the stuff cleaned up. So we. Right. Like there was nothing we could do. We just had to wait until they said, okay, now you can get in here. So it was kind of like a relaxing period for it was. us also that we yeah. could just, all right, so that happened. Now we're just going to get back and wait. There's nothing we yeah, can do. Aren't you, I mean, to get completely technical, aren't you paying rent on that time still? We, we were paying rent. So, I mean, I don't mind sharing it because it's public knowledge. So we, our agreement was $200 a month for the first year. Okay. So when the fire was over, they were like, the city said, make us an offer. You know, like what? What do you feel is what, fair? Yeah, what do you feel is fair? And I said, well, we're, we just had a fire and our building has water, you know, hundreds of gallons of water. Roof damage, on it. Roof water damage, damage. smoke like, like, damage. Yeah. Offer you $810, which is what we owed on our lease for that year. And they were like, okay. So we bought this okay. building for basically $2,000 for a year's worth of rent is what we got it for. Well, we, that's helpful. That was very helpful. Wait, very, so you own the building, or you're saying you paid off the lease in full? We own the building. Wow. We buy our building. We, we purchased the building. Can I just say bravo, City of Lexington. <laughs> yeah, that's right. pretty awesome. Yeah, but that's, that, yeah, that's that good. Was, they support because they want. They want yeah. to exist. Right. right. And they, it's good for the community. And that's another thing about our community. I mean, our, our city uh, leaders and city council are amazing. Like, we've had right. nothing but good things from them. Um, they've helped us in ways that other cities wouldn't do it just because you know they're bigger to this their is, best interest to have right. you guys this succeed. Is a small town area and, and everybody knows everybody and so it was um they've been great that's cool so yeah i mean much like the pandemic when everybody just kind of stopped and shut down it allowed everybody to have a little grace a little time a little reflection and maybe that also inspired people to learn a craft or read a few more books or do whatever so do you think that maybe in a way it's kind of a blessing in disguise you had this moment this downtime where the building needed to be rehabilitated, rehabilitated to where you could actually, I mean, your, your masonry, masoners, masoners, I can't say, that. yeah. It's not like that's the nice lead in to start running a hospitality joint, you know, <laughs> regardless of making beer or not, you now are a, a community house. You're gonna be dealing with the public. Right. You're serving a, a product to, to people. So this is a whole different industry than what you're used to. Uh, did you, did you learn a lot about beer during this time? Yeah. Are we figuring yeah. it out? We learned a lot. We um, spent a lot more time with our brewers, Eric and Brandon, hanging out with them. And then as time went on, we just started bringing more people on our team. And yeah. that just helped us. And so it was just like we all were in school together and we would get together pretty much weekly or monthly. Then it became weekly. We would just meet up and sit around and drink beer and just make notes and talk about dream dreams because dream. I think that one of the biggest things is dreaming dreams right making big plans just reaching for the stars and please tell me you have a beer called dreaming dreams or you've made one <laughs> we will and you will That's a good idea. okay we need to. <clears throat> let me know when that comes out and with all due respect I mean this with respect Ashley you're from here your whole life yes this is a unique new uh, spin on the accent of North Carolina. This is, this is I, I know, guess, Lexington. That's why I was very concerned about doing a podcast. <laughs> you don't want to let it out? You it's authentic. Want to let it out. No, no, you want to keep it secret? <laughs> no. But I mean, you know, there's like very subtle things you hear. And, you know, I'm a Californian, so everything sounds a little different to me in general. But now that I've been here for eight years, I'm starting to go deeper into the, the subtext of what it means. And Lexington, because Robin over there, you bring it, you bring it out there too. It, it is a whole separate sound uh, that we're, Leah's laughing. She's shaking her head. She's like, "Oh yeah, you know you're in Lexington." Yes. Which right. is kind of it's it's charming though. So Thank you. so let's let's get back into the business of it. So now this is still pre-pandemic. Yeah, pre-pandemic. Post fire. Post fire, 2019. So we started. Um, we got the approval in basically in January, um, 2019, that we could start back on the building, so we fired everything back up, got an uh, architect, engineer, back out here to make sure everything was good, started planning, and 
just roll with it. We actually started renovations in April of 2019, uh, completed in early February 2020, and you're ready to open. Hey, you're ready to go. We Zeus. should open on leap year. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. They said, and <laughs> <laughs> we opened up, and it was insanely busy, crazy. It was. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that we would be as busy as we were. Right. Day one. Day yes. one. I mean, it was February never. 29th. It was not the most. I mean, it's February, so you know you get what cold, you get. Yeah. It's not a so it was like started off a little sunny, ended up cloudy, but that did not stop anyone from. Oh, I'm sure they were up. chomping at the bit. I mean, it was. Do you have any idea how many people you uh, serviced that day? I have no idea. It's all kind of a blur. I do know that our bartenders at the time, they started at, they were here at 11 o'clock that morning, getting things ready. We opened the doors at 12. And finally at 9.30, we had to say last call because they had not gotten a break or ate a morsel of food the entire day. And my, even my sister, my sister-in-law had jumped behind the bar several times to help out. It was just insane. I mean, I forgot how we kicked Pretty much all the beer that we had brewed, we kicked it that day. <laughs> oh, man. Um, that's fun. You know, that, that's something that I've observed, and we were talking this on the car ride over here, but just to understand for people in visiting Lexington, uh, from what I understand, there's somewhere between 18,000 and 20,000 people in the city of Lexington, right. but uh, and there's 15 barbecue restaurants that are well-supported and seem to be doing well financially. Uh, we were just over at Lexington Barbecue, you know, the Monk family, and I guess they feed on average 900 to 1,000 people a day. You guys just said you kicked all the beer on day one. I mean, that just goes to show your capture rate for the people that live in Lexington. They're really supporting Lexington right. business. I mean, that's, that's, that's yeah. incredible. That's what, I mean, that's what has really blown us away. So we opened up the 29th, and uh, that's, I guess it was that week after that, whenever you started hearing the rumors of COVID and you know what was going to happen. And so the day that we went from construction to operational with our bank loans and at the lawyer's office and all that stuff, getting everything finalized was March the 16th. And Tyler called, I was walking out of the lawyer's office, he called and he was like, yeah, we're getting ready to be shut down today at five o'clock. I was like, you got to be kidding. That's just a punch like, in the gut. So what what is this? Lakes. So we were open, and this, you know, business had already Shut started down. dwindling because of that. You know, people were right. scared people, and yeah. not coming out. And, um, so then we were like, well, we had all of our tanks, four tanks, and we're full with tank. brand new beers that no one had ever tasted before, and you know, beers that people don't even drink very often, except in craft we beer. We were just trying to introduce. Well, Some I have to styles. imagine that you looked at the brewers after opening day and, and kicking these beers. You're like, we got to get to work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was so like, we need like, a lot more beer. Right. So we're making this beer yeah. to inevitably be shut down again. So now you're. And so that's what beer. we were. We were like, well, here we are again. We have the opposite. <laughs> we have too much beer and nobody. <laughs> right. You know, what are we going to do? And we. We had talked to our manager, you know right when we opened and said, okay, so when do you think we could start canning some beer? And he said, oh, no, we need to wait until we can get our product, you know. Um, find more right, and, find and probably I would say we're not even going to start thinking about it for six months to a year. Well, then whenever we got shut down and we could not even have people come into the building, we had to, uh, we put up a storefront out of one of the garage doors and we said, We've got to, we have no way to get our product out. Yeah. We've got to figure out how to can now. Mm. And so we put all of our energy into trying to figure out how to do that. And there was one purchase that we had made right before we opened, and that was a crowler machine, one crowler machine. Oh, Thank nice. goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. That got your pay for itself. <laughs> that, yes, yeah. it did. Quick. Because uh, that's how we did it. We made crowler just, one by one, one thing just one heard. can at a time. Your house is probably the most valuable asset you own. But think about it. How much time do you spend taking care of it day to day? Enter Exhale, where you get a dedicated home manager who takes the time to understand your home's unique needs 
and ensures cleaning, maintenance, and inspections are taken care of. And if you need help with repair or improvement, Exhale will handle that too. Visit exhaleathome.com to learn more and book a consultation. We'll take it from here. Triangle Wine Company, locally owned and operated. Triangle Wine Company is committed to creating the best shopping experience in fine wine and craft beer. Hi, this is Nikki with Triangle Wine Company. Wanted to let you know we have an upcoming farm-to-table wine dinner at our Cary location on September the 15th from 6.30 to 8.30. Tickets are $65 per person. Get all the details and your tickets at trianglewineco.com. One thing we learned about the pandemic is it didn't slow people down from drinking. No. no. In fact, the, the, that last year was the record for the most alcohol purchased and consumed in North Carolina. Right. Just well, speaking about North Carolina. Yeah. Across general. the world. I mean, yeah, yeah Diageo yeah. just reported like a 16% gain in, it's you know, over, yeah. over 2020, 2021 fiscal. Yeah. So you were able to keep the lights on, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you, you didn't have to keep all the lights on because you didn't need anyone coming in here, but you effectively just turned into like a retail shop at some point. Yeah. Right? We just, so that's, we just have to go and we just opened, we just, we, so we met, we we're like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? We said, we're going to open seven days a week, 12 to six. That's what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. And, um, the community, I mean, people would walk up and be like, I want to buy a bar stool. I'll buy a table. I'll buy whatever I can buy. I want to support you or just here's you know 10 bucks you know right they just oh, wanted cool. to they're like, we can't believe that this has happened you know you work you had all these other issues and now you're dealing with this and but again our staff but they were like all right we're gonna do whatever we have to do to make this happen we're not going anywhere we're, there's nowhere for us to go so let's make it happen yeah. well, make you, the best of it you guys are the uh, prime example of resiliency so Kudos well, to you. It was, our staff was really, because there's no way we could have done it. So our staff is the one that has been driving this whole thing for us and helping us and like have always been encouraging through this and they've been great. And so when we were doing that, we had a mobile canning company came in, they posted something on Instagram and they had been down here a couple of times. And so I just said, hey, we've got tanks full when can you get us? And they were like, we can be out there March 29th, I think, or March 28th, something, it was a Sunday. Is that fine? Yeah, it's the only spot you got. It's good. Let's rock it out. We had no labels. We had nothing. We didn't even know how to make a label. Right. Like, you know, we didn't, we had not, that was not on our radar. So we just, supposed to have approval and all this stuff, and they were like, just, just get the label done, get it printed, put it on the can, and Ask for forgiveness. Nobody's going to say anything right now. This is right. This know, is the time. This is the first for everybody. So you've got to. There's some grace allowed. Yeah, there was. To do this. Allowed. So that's what we did, and it worked out. Uh, so let's talk about. Let's get into the creative side of this. This is a brewery. When you make a brewery, you have to kind of think like, what are we going to do? What kind of beer are we going to be? What kind of image are we going to be to this community? What is? What's the service? So in your in your words, what type of brewery is this brewery? Uh, flavor profile and all. What are you thinking? Um, they, our brewers are more of the German style, um, but then that's what they were when they're home brewing. When they came here, we just kind of told them just to get funky with it. Like, do your own thing. Try some different things that you wouldn't normally try a home brewing or the other brewers, you know, are not necessarily doing. And, you know, for example, our Lexington Late Lager, it's just they, there's nothing special about it, but that's what people in Lexington like. You know, mm-hmm. they come in almost something that tastes like Bud Light. Make a ultra. Yeah. Here you go. This is your cool. This is your crushable. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of the things they said that helped them is they had 10 years of home brewing and they said they made beer for family and friends mm-hmm. and they had to figure out what they could make that everyone would like. That was great. So they worked on that hard for 10 years. Yeah. And to so make it smooth and to crisp. To make it smooth. And, yeah. And not have a, people like it, but not to be, a, you know, always have that bitter taste at the end, like some places that's their thing. So they just, they've done really well and they're not afraid to try new things. They're not afraid to experiment, to do things. If we, anything we suggest, they're like, okay, we'll try it. You know, yeah. some, some, some stuff they're like, oh, no. so, that's not happening. <laughs> and, and size wise, you guys have a 10 barrel system, yes. right? So <clears throat> Max way in here, but from what I remember from the breweries, it's for a craft brewer to be of like medium size craft brewery, it's usually a nine barrel system, right? It's a, like 10, you're a pretty good size. Yes, yeah, it's medium like, size for, for 
what you, North Carolina for the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's beautiful out, out there. I mean, yeah, it, it's pristine, brand new, which is nice. So you've got all brand new equipment, your chillers, like everything is. You're making it so that the beer is easily made. Not not to say beer is easy made, but you right, know, it's you're set up for success. Yeah, yeah, you've got a nice facility back there, and a ten barrel system allows you to produce a decent amount of beer. Decent amount of beer, and we've got a ton of room for expansion and um, for other tanks. And that yeah. was you know from the advice from Joel and Jamie and that, you know yeah. like how to do some layout. I mean, they just helped us with that as far as looking forward thinking about being able to bring in more tanks and. That's kind of where we are right now. Like we're trying to figure out when it's not. I mean, it's going to happen. We're just trying to figure out when because you know cash flow and not sure. being open and all that. But we do have the issue of needing more more tanks already, which is a good thing, yeah. a good problem to have. Comparison wise, like Foothills, I have the impression is a pretty big brewery because you see them very yeah. well represented around the state. How many barrel systems do they have? Uh, do you I know? don't know what they are right now. But it's, it's big. It's, it's, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're like they're way where, over twenty. Yeah, their warehouse where they where they do their um, di, um, distribution is bigger than our whole building right here. Right. Oh wow. Okay. Yes, I mean, and this is a big building, like square footage yeah, we're, wise. We're twenty thousand square feet. Okay. Yeah, I think they're probably a hundred, hundred twenty thousand square feet. What they're two hundred bucks a month <laughs> for twenty thousand square <laughs> yeah. feet for that time. I assume you. That's well, but no, you that own was the building. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah, so we it. own our building where a lot of other people don't own the building so that was so yeah i mean i i know the economics of a brewery i know what what that means you guys must be doing all right then that's that's a good thing Mm -hmm. and that's a good thing to i mean you have employees you have staff you've been able to open it up and that that then kind of feeds the the next levels of what we're talking about because uh you did uh, get into a a food truck you have some food that's being provided i've noticed I've, i've seen this kind of style happening more and more at breweries Instead of going back in and say take this space that we're in and turning it into a kitchen, which would be very expensive in, right. the, in the in the upfit, it's like just get a truck, and the truck could just be isolated on its own, act work on its own, and then you yeah. don't have to do any modifications to the building. And then and obviously then the truck can be mobile if needed. But really, I assume that the truck is more stationary it's, here. Yes, yeah, more for here. So that's um, when we were in the middle of the shut down and we were only open from two to nine and that was in uh, January of this year and we're like what can we do you know to expand our hours because we didn't know how long we were going to be shut at nine o'clock so we said we have coffee register we have espresso machines we have coffee let's we're already here working yeah we're in here the mornings. and we say that we're for our community so let's open at 9 a.m yeah. and so we started doing that, and we were like at the same time talking about. And we also invited drive. people to come in and do work and school. school yeah. Because you know you can school space learning, out in here. Yeah. Learning. Oh wow. And we yeah. could open the doors, you know, and bump the heat up, and I mean, I, and really in the even in the dead of winter, it's super warm in there because we get the morning sun, and so it's super nice and comfortable. And so we had a friend that we had talked to last year about the food truck, and it just wasn't the right time. You know, we were trying to open and. Um, so she came back to us again and she's like look I've got to get move this truck do you want it she made us an offer we couldn't refuse talked with Tyler from the perfect blend and so we said let's do it you know let's let's do this food truck thing so we opened it so this was in February and we opened March 1st and so within 2021 yeah of this year just recently yeah. yeah so what type of food are you making it's all flatbread pizzas yeah, so, that goes well with, with beer. Yeah, so nice job. Yeah, and you're not going to do barbecue. We that, have a barbecue pizza. Oh, you do? Oh, there yeah. you go. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, and then now, and we're in in a, a sub room from the whole space. And this is a, a, a pretty beautiful coffee roasting company that you just mentioned. So speak to us a little bit more about that. How'd that come to be? Our friend Tyler and Madison Prevat, they owned a place, and they still own a place uptown called Perfect Blend Roastery, and they were needing to expand, and we were all friends, and so whenever we started building this space, we were like, why don't you come down here, and we'll just put you in here too, and, yeah. and For him too. what goes better than together than coffee and beer? I mean, those are my <laughs> two favorite things. Me too. So, yes. Yeah. And so then you throw in the, pe- the food truck and say coffee, beer, and pizza. And I know. Nobody really, needs to go anywhere else. Nobody needs to go anywhere. Yeah. And, and there, yeah, the food truck was, 
um, for it to stay here so that we can have a lunch option, so that we could be open and serve lunch from 11 to 2, Monday through Saturday, and then to use it as fill-ins if other food trucks, you know, could make it for whatever reason, um, we would have one that we could, you know, roll in place and not be down because that's, I mean, that's a huge draw is to go out to breweries and food trucks, and mm -hmm. that's one of the things that... We take our kids to a lot of, uh, and have taken them to a right. lot of breweries, and they, I mean, we need to have food, too. In fact, that's a, that's a deciding factor a lot of times for us to go to a brewery is, well, do they have anything to eat? Do they right. have a food truck? And so we offer, um, in the evenings, we have other food trucks that come in, and um, back in August of last year, we kind of um, partnered up with Medley Food Truck, and so they're here um, most Thursday through Saturday. They're on site every night, and he's menus changes up uh, week, uh, weekly or every two weeks. And so that's been a good consistent thing for him and for us because yeah. we know that, I mean, he's very dependable. He's always here. Um, Everyone loves his food. Right. So we're, that's been good. And then we also have like, you know, the lobster dolls and Cousins of Maine and some taco trucks. And so it's all the time is changing. Well, that Cousins uh, food truck is a, is a big draw. Yeah, that's a huge draw. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's get back to the beer for a second. Yeah, well, I was wondering, are you still... Are you still working with cans? And mm -hmm. are you still doing, what's your... So we're canning again when, uh, this coming Wednesday. We'll be canning our uh, L-Cubed, our Wandering Pig, and our Glass Goose Seltzer. So what's your distribution take now? What, what, are you mm -hmm. looking to expand? Are you looking to, like, are we going to see some Goose and the Monkey in the Triangle? Or are you going to Yeah, we, to we've, uh, we've got a guy that just started doing sales this year, uh, John Shook, and he is out and about today. He started in the Triad area. Mm -hmm. So he's uh, Greensboro, High Point, Winston, Salisbury. We're in the Lowe's Foods, Food Lines, Mom and Pop Bottle Shops. Um, That's great. Even some other some other breweries that put us in. Uh, and are you going through a distributor? Or are you no, we're just doing it all. Okay. You can do yep. that with the Red Oak rule, right? Until you get to, is it 50,000? 50, 50, 50, 50, I think is what it is now. It's yeah. like 49,999. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're underneath that, underneath you can self-distribute once you get above that. Then you have to be a part of a right. larger distributor uh, distribution company, which you know it's like, yeah, you've arrived because you've made that much, but then there is a huge break in the connection, mm -hmm. the salespeople, the story, right. and you're giving it off to guys like this guy over here, who's a by daytime a, a wine rep, you know, and he's like, yeah, yeah I know, yeah, I, I'll sell you beer, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's like really, do, do I don't sell man? beer. You don't sell. Beer. <laughs> no, yeah. so. that's a good thing. <laughs> <Just kidding>. Well. <laughs> Uh, but that's great. So you have a plan. So that, that's the whole beautiful thing I love about beer and breweries and why it's such a great viable company to be in. Because for one, everyone loves drinking beer. It's pretty, it's, it's food, <laughs> technically. And uh, it's ubiquitous, but also you can be as creative and, and exciting about your drinks as well. But then you have people coming to your place and then you have the ability to sell it retail to people just going around. And then you have the ability to sell wholesale to other businesses, so it's a really like great three-dimensional business that you can go out there. So, where do you see your growth? Like, what what are you hoping to get to? What, what's your what's your? Because you said you already need to expand and you're get sure more. You're dream big. Right. Yeah. So, what what is that big dream? For us to, I want to expand and to get out of this building. Like, I want to expand where this building can't contain us anymore. That we have to be like a foothills and go find another building that. To have our tanks and i want you know I, yeah everybody that's one thing joel told us everybody has to have an exit strategy well i don't want to do like my exit strategy is going to be passing it on to my kids like i i have no intention of selling it out until like well you're going to well, when they come and wave the dollar well if they ever do i'm not in it for the money i'm in it to have fun and i'm in it to for my family and for my community i mean that's i grew up with my family and then once we got married with her family like to work you know like nothing has, was ever given to us everything we've got we work for so you know let me get, let me hook you up with the guys from wicked weed and tell you that <laughs> well, I, that's a whole thing they were in the money anyway yeah yeah but they i mean but also even appalachian brewing uh mountain brewing we're all part of that cba uh right that smaller consortium that then was bought by anheuser-busch 
that then gave you all the improvements that you needed to make and they were the ones and that funded to do all of that. All of that. And they're still making their beer. And the best part for, for that scenario is Anheuser-Busch doesn't want to tell you how to do your business. They're like, no, 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 we bought you because we know it's a viable company to do that. So continue doing what you're doing. What do you need? 40 more tanks? Cool. Done. <laughs> is that what you need? What else do you want? Because we're going to make money off of you. We want you to grow. And we learned, too, that it's not always green on the other side, you know. Yeah. And I just feel like for us, as a husband and wife, we feel like that all these people that we have working for us are our family also. And so it's, I don't know, we just don't want to do that, and money's not everything. I've, I've been down that road in my younger years with past history with my parents, and it's just not a, it doesn't end well. Yeah, yeah, you want so, it to be yours. Want it to be mine. So I want to ask you this: uh, If I'm visiting Lexington and I have time for three beers or a, a beer sampler, and you want me to know Goose and the Monkey and go tell it to when I go back to Charlotte or when I go even to other states, what what beers would you give me? I'd give you the El Cube, the Lexington Light Lager, Wandering Pig, our Seltzer, and then one of our sours. Yeah. Oh, he went over. You, you went to four. I yeah. don't know if I've ruined it for you. That's no, flight. Flight. You that's give me a Celtic. Yeah. yeah. That's our flight. That's our flight boards. <laughs> that's Celtics, your flight. Okay. That's, I mean, that's a huge industry now, right? I yeah. Mean, I kidded around with Greg, who's the brewer over at Y Hill, and we told him we needed him <clears> to. I was consulting there, and I was like, you know, you need to make a seltzer. He said, I don't want to make any freaking seltzers. Truly's White Claws, those are gross. I'm like, yeah, because that that's that industry. But when a craft brewer such as yourself wants to start making it, you can make it delicious. And it He's is. Like, Damn you. It is different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You and can it make is a delicious, very delicious seltzer. Yes. So, yeah. And so what, what's the flavor profile of your seltzer? Uh, one we have on tap right now is the mixed berry. And what we're getting ready to can on Wednesday is, the ra- is raspberry. And what's your so, active alcohol ingredient in there? How are you making it? Uh, like, is it like I, when we were making it, we were making it with Everclear. No, we're, we are. It's a. Uh, You're brewing. We're brewing a Scott. Like it's a ethanol. different kind of yeast. Yeah, it's a different kind of yeast and sugar. Yeah. So. Okay, so you're doing it naturally. Naturally, yeah. yeah. We're, we're not. And the, whatever fruit we're doing, it's coming. We're getting it from like a Oregon fruit. You know, we're using either puree or we're um, they can find something decent. But right now, it's just like everything else in other parts. Materials are hard to come by yeah. on certain things like that. Yeah. Do you work with California malt? Like, or, or, or Carol- California, sorry. Carolina, Carolina malt? malt? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to get our um, LQ to be all North Carolina sourced. That's and great. so that's what we're, that's like our first beer that we're rolling to. And I think we're almost there. Hops so. traditionally are not going to be grown here in North Carolina. Right. It's just, it's that's, not really a commodity that's grown out in this area. But aside from that, it's nice that you can yeah, do all the other sourcing locally. Yeah. It is, they've been, really great to work with. I mean, they've really given every you call them and they're like, oh, well, I can run that over to you. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. You know, and you're not having to, to wait and it's there within an hour. Is the hops supply, like everything else, gone up in price and lower mm-hmm. or demand has risen and supply yes. is less? Yeah. Like if you, we see it, we you better be ready to purchase right then because if you don't, it's, it might not be there in an hour or two hours, you know, when you go back to right. make so, the payment. So has that supply chain changed what beers you guys are making or doing? It just made us be smarter about when we purchase. Okay. To go ahead and purchase Imp- more. Like, so yeah. it improved our forecasting too. So, that, I mean, that's been some of the good stuff about COVID. It has taught us a lot of things that we didn't really, we knew it made us do it. Like, right. all right, we got to forecast further out than what we've been doing or what we're going to do. So, so that, that we that just we don't can, have a knee drug reaction. We actually plan. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, we're needing to buy the, so if we buy our malt, we're buying it for X number of brews now instead of just like for two or three. We're just going ahead and getting several pallets in at a time and doing what we need. Same thing with the hops. We're just trying to, to forecast and have it in. And I love and that. Roll. Uh, you know, just, that, that's, a, that's a phrase that I've heard many times now. And it's like we've all in this industry had to kind of be very intentional about how we're going to do things so that we can keep the lights on. Because prior to that, it's like, let's just open a brewery and we'll make like 18 different beers and like some will sell and some won't, but it's fine. We're just experimenting. It's like, no, no, no. All that has to go out the door yeah. and everything has to have an intention. Like we're going to buy this, we're going to produce this, we're going to sell this, and then we're going to buy the next thing and we have to make sure that this fits on a, on a bottom line, on, yeah. on a spec sheet, you know? And that's, so. that's kind of what we've said too, is like we've got to make, yes, we need to have new stuff. We have to make stuff that will sell. Mm-hmm. That's, 
at the end of the day. That's yeah, what it's, yeah about. it's a balance. A healthier company uh, for it. Uh, and you want the brewers to be creative, you know, but you also have to balance that between yeah. things that yeah. do sell. It's creativity, but it's a creative business. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I won't name names, but there's a lot of companies out there that uh, instead of being different and setting yourself apart and forecasting, like you guys said, to say, well, we need more inventory because we're going to sell and we're going to get bigger. They just decided to hold things closer to the vest and thus piss off their customers, not have enough inventory and just say, well, oh, well, it's the pandemic, you know, so that's how it is. And, and uh, I think that's a very, uh, I applaud the way you guys think about it because it's a very open-minded way. Well, with our community, we didn't, we want to have them, they want to drink when they come in here. Yeah. And not be like that because this is, we consider this the community watering hole and we, they supported us through day one. And so we want to give back to them of what they want. And so a lot of it is driven off of their feedback to us. And and we also want to educate the customer, right. our community, and say, this is what craft beer is. And so we're giving you something you like and something maybe you're more familiar with, but let's move you a little bit into yeah. some let's different uh, advent- flavor adventurous. profiles. Yeah, so like example was like the Q City um, Blonde that we did. They just decided during the pandemic, we're gonna infuse a couple of barrels of, barrels of it with uh, blueberry. Well, once people found out about that, they were driving from Chapel Hill and Charlotte, and you know, coming in, buying it. We were making up crowders of it. We would, you know, buy the cases. They would just take it back with because they they loved it. Yeah, it and so delicious. This time we brewed uh, back in the spring. We brewed it. We just did five barrels of the regular, five barrels of the blue, and I mean the blue sold it's again. Gone. It's That's gone. awesome. So you know, it was just. People are paying attention. Yeah. They're willing to try, and especially in, beer. And it's good for us. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for inviting us into your brewery. This has been uh, quite an experience, and thank you for the beer, too. It's delicious. Matt, what else you got? Yeah. You guys are doing something awesome here, really. It's... it's uh, it's a it's it's a reason to come to Lexington. So for all of you out there, come to Lexington. Come to the Goose and the Monkey Brewery. Check out their pizza from Poor Folk Pizza. You will eat and drink extremely merrily. Thanks for listening to the NC F&B podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged. Proof Alcohol Ice Cream. We pour art and science into every bite. An artisan ice cream company from Columbia, South Carolina. Proof is changing the way people think about dessert.